<laughs> All right, David, welcome uh, to the Anything Goes podcast, mate. It's good to have you. It's good to see you as well. Um, we've, you, I don't, we're, you're new to this and so are we, but normally we, um, we have this thing that we did it with our first one where we just ask five real fast questions that just one word answers. And it just gives people who don't know you. Let's uh, let, I mean, David can say maybe a couple of words, like yeah. we, we won't come down on you too hard, David. It's all right. You just go, you know me. All right. I'm the, I'm the ready fire aim person. Yeah. I like that. Sounds a bit like uh, some of the police. <laughs> <laughs> Anything goes, anything goes, anything goes. <laughs> oh, no, David, honestly, he, this is why he's on this podcast. Cause I'm like, I'm just going to let you loose and let you out into the world. And you can say all the craziest things. That but you I've had like, uh, I still want to, I always think of my favorite joke nights with different people around the world. Like, I mean, over, I mean, I remember how old I am. I'm almost 60. And so, you know, more still one of my favorite nights, right? <laughs> because it's your timing. Your timing is impeccable. So I've got and one, a, and you got a, and you got a, a fill, and you got a filthy mouth. Yeah. He well, does. I've got one. I'll tell you. I got a new one. I'll tell you, but I can't tell you. I'm yeah, recording. No, no, yeah. Because okay. no, no, when, 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 when he says anything goes, he's not like anything, anything. It's kind yeah, of just anything. Yeah. <laughs> All, All right. right. So first one of the fast five is if you had a party guest, uh, any party guest you could have, what, uh, living or dead, uh, come to dinner, who would it be? You and Anna. Yeah. <laughs> Great answer. Great I thought answer. I, I went through all the typical Nelson Mandela, Gandhi. Yeah. They want uh, Mike Tyson went through my head. Uh, yeah. So many. Uh, I think you and you and Anna. I struggled when Anna asked me that question. In our first one, I was like, uh, so many people, and I couldn't pick just one. You know, who did you actually say, babe? I can't even remember. Um, I chose Joe Rogan initially right. in the end, but in the, I went with someone like really obtuse, like like Johnny Rotten from the Sex Pistols or something That's like that. Right. Oh, he'd be good too. Yeah, Joe yeah. Rogan would, would be great too. Yeah, yeah. but sure. you'd have to be smoking a lot of weed. That <laughs> I was about to say we'd be smoking some sleep. I don't know if I would survive. <laughs> oh, you would stop. Okay, D- uh, David, what is your favorite cuisine? I know you're a foodie. You know, my range is so vast, and I cook all kinds of things. So. Um, my favorite cuisine is when I can cook for people who love food, but in any genre. So it's like music. So tell me what you love and I'll cook it and mm. see if I can hit the sweet spot for you. So my favorite cuisine is that it surprised me with something and I've got to make it. It challenges me to, to create. Cause I love all food. I love that. Okay. Well, I don't like Chinese Mexican. restaurants. So is that bad? That's not bad. You okay. can cook, you can cook us Mexican when we come. All right, my hey, my son's his Father's Day yesterday, and oh, my son's they took me out for a game of golf, and they cooked me a surprise dinner. And he, my son Ben, made, maybe and Cal, made me the best burrito I've ever eaten in my life. Ooh. Oh wow! Yeah. Big call because you are a foodie. That's a massive. I'm call. a foodie. Yeah, Ooh. I love it. Okay, this I want to ask this one because I'm like so like, hey, interested. This is meant to be my turn. Okay, go, 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 go. No, no, you go. It's all right. You get out. Oh. I know you're dying to. Okay, best piece of advice you've ever been given. Slow down. Oh, I was really? 15. Yeah, I was making love to a woman. She was a lot older. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. Her name was her name was Val Wiseman. <laughs> I love it. She slow was a down. lot older. Like, uh, slow down. Okay. Now, um, uh, yeah. Honey, <laughs> take just, note. Hey, hey, honey, <laughs> slow down. Take yeah. note. I think that's a really good one. You know, Many. Hey, I do. I, I do have serious answers, but we're not going to go there just yet because anything goes. Let's carry yeah. on. <laughs> yeah, exactly. All right, babe, you're up. Like I say, I'm here for I'm here for a good time, not a long time. Um, <laughs> okay, so when you were young, what did you want to be when you grew up? Like I know a fair bit about your story, but if you think back to when you were maybe a child, if you had a an ideal astronaut. Pocket- Really, okay. I always wanted to go to the moon. I was fascinated. I still fascinated. I still believe I'm going to do uh, space tourism. I, I know that mm. Branson or someone's going to go there, and I still feel that you know because I can afford to go now that I'm going to end up in space at some some way. Yeah. Um, and so yeah, I've always, I always I just was fascinated by the moon. You will too, David. I my very first mentor when I was eighteen, David is also David. Ooh, that's weird. Ooh, um, he, I remember he's he bought one of the very first tickets still, so he's still got it outstanding, like or standing to the moon, like on I think it's Branson. It's Branson. Branson, yeah, Branson, two hundred thousand. Yep, yeah. he yeah, two hundred thousand. So I know that you, you'll be up there as well. And Branson's going to be on that first flight. And I actually thought about doing that one, uh, yeah. um, you know, but it was just something I just, you know, you know me, never got around to it. But I thought, yeah, yeah. that would be a fun one to yeah. sign up for. Great Denise. conversation piece. Yeah, I have a ticket. For the, I have a ticket for the space. Yeah, for the space. We're going to the space. Yeah. Hey, the guys right, so- know you as well as I have over the last, you know, 
seven years or so, I'm, I'm not at all surprised that you're going to the going to space. Yeah. <laughs> and we're Probably not talking naked. about with Joe Rogan. No, yeah, yeah. No, no, definitely not. <laughs> naked with a draft beer, like yeah. oh, having everyone sing beer. along. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Having everyone sing along on the spacecraft, like living your best life. <laughs> yeah. It's a long way to Tipperary. <laughs> All right. So if you had one superpower, what would you want yours to be? Oh, you know, it's so interesting. It's a, such a great question because I, I have so many I could think about, mm. but I would probably, the, the, the glib answer would be to eradicate the world of mosquitoes. Mm. <laughs> I just don't like being bitten. <laughs> right? I, yeah. <laughs> but I think, my, I think my superpower, I think I have one. Mm -hmm. And I think everyone does. My superpower is to get to know people so quickly mm. and so genuinely that strangers it blows their minds how quickly they're welcome into my world and how quickly they share things. People say it all the time to me, I'll know them in like five minutes and they'll say things like, I've never told anyone this, or hmm. well, they just feel so open and welcome and it's just disarming. So the ability, and it doesn't matter whether they speak my language or not, it's just to walk into situations in the world with complete strangers and turn it into this thing where this magical thing just occurs. And it's just being completely fearless in my body and transparent and completely authentic and and all those things kind of you know and and silly a lot mm -hmm. of touching i very touch silly. a lot of, i'm very touchy feely and so yeah so i think that's it is just to really allow people to connect deeper than they ever have i love that and, and i've seen you do that as well yeah. in actual i like, actually live into that in real life as well it's actually it is a super power because i'm something something i know i struggle with anna doesn't she just is able to cut straight through people and just their walls come down so fast and so quickly so it is that is a superpower for sure well david do you know what and i want to go that's where i'm like boom that's where we're beginning because when morgs and i did our very first podcast we asked ourselves these questions and we had you know we never talked about what we were going to say and both of us for the best piece of advice we ever have been given both said something that you had taught us so wow. mine was from david t.s wood how you do anything is how you do everything and Morgs, yours was um, don't take slow advice down. from. <laughs> yeah, sure, that's true. Slow now, down. Before this podcast, it was um, <laughs> don't take advice from broke, unhappy people. Um, yeah. And I think that piece of advice came for me um, right at the right time in my life too, because you know it, it really just changed a lot of the way that I perceive advice in general and um, and how I take it on and who I take it on from as well. But where did, where did you learn? Like, where did you get come up, not come up with that advice, but how did it land on you? The, the don't, uh, don't take advice from broken. Yeah. Well, yeah. I, I grew up in poverty. I mean, even by Western standards, I mean, cause I mean, there's poverty and poverty and because I've traveled in over a hundred countries, you know, I've seen extreme poverty. Mm. Uh, and, but so by even by Western standards, we lived in extreme poverty. So three beds, four kids, a condemned building. Every third night, one of us had to sleep with my mom. You know, people were murdered there. My sister used to have to put perfume on a handkerchief to walk up the stairs. We were on the third floor because it reeked of urine. And, you know, I mean, it was just like, and we had no fridge. One room was had human feces all over the wall. So we couldn't go in there. There were rats. I mean, so that was pretty extreme by a Western standard poverty, right? Um, and so, you know, so, and I grew up around broke people and broke people have broke thoughts. And, you know, it's like, if we saw as a kid, if we saw a Rolls Royce or an expensive car, my friends would call them assholes or, you know, rich bastards or whatever. It was just this thing. And I, so I grew up in this world where, you know, rich was something we could never be. And, and we never, and we, you know, we, we were sort of taught to hate the rich. Mm -hmm. And 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 so Rich had a, a, a stigma. And then when I started to really do the work, which I mean, I, again, part of this is why you're doing the podcast is to do the work or share the work, yeah. you know, in a, in a more authentic and a light way, which I love. Um, you know, and I started to realize that, you know, Rich wasn't, you know, Rich wasn't, it wasn't good or bad. You know, there are rich people who have a certain energy and there's, you know, poor people who have a certain energy, but rich is a choice or, you know, wealth is a choice. And I didn't know I could choose it. I didn't know I could navigate life to become extremely wealthy, not only to become wealthy, but to have freedom of time and wealth at the same time. And really the whole life by design, 
it's really hard to design a life if you're completely broke, mm -hmm. right? Because yeah. I did that because I backpacked for 10 and a half years around the world with no money. So I understand what that looks like, but it means each day, you, what you got to do is you got to find food, you got to find a bed to sleep. So your whole, my whole days were kind of some, quite often, I was, you know, consumed by the simplest things like finding food, <laughs> which sounds crazy, right? <laughs> I, well, I remember one of the stories I've heard. So when, when we did the introduction as well, I'm so excited to like, we're going to tell everyone. So by the time they're listening to this, they're going to have heard you've trained over a million students globally. You've traveled the world. You've done all these phenomenal things. But one of the stories I remember you saying was that every new city you went to when you were backpacking the world was that you couldn't, what was it? You couldn't get spend any money and any money until you found a job. So you and often slept and, on and the some, roof. And somewhere to live. And so I had live. to find accommodation and I had to find work. So, and so I wasn't allowed to spend a nickel. So yeah. yeah, so I had to, so what it forced me to do, and I would say if someone's unemployed right now, you know, if you ever treated getting a job like working, then you'd spend the, get up and you'd get dressed and you'd be out at eight o'clock and you'd work for eight to 10 hours and then you'd come back. And I would do that. I would just work the whole day at, at finding work. Unemployed. And I didn't always take what I had, I, but I would just go and meet people and look at, and I would go and knock on doors. And sometimes I would take a crappy job as a stepping stone to something else. Cause I always knew first I needed to, to, to survive and then I would thrive. So I'd always like mm. sometimes do things I didn't want to do to get what I wanted to do. Cause I didn't know the area or I didn't know the country. Or I didn't know the people. So, and quite often the, the shortest I was ever employed was what was it? 17 minutes. Good. I was working in a lat in Israel and I was a pool attendant and there were all these very, very heavy Europeans sitting around treating me like crap. And you know, one guy's like flicking his fingers like this. And I'm like, Oh really? So I took the shirt. I had a work shirt on with the name of the resort and I took it off and I put it in his hand and I walked out. This is, and this is what I love about you, David. Like, so you are fundamentally Morgan and I's biggest mentor, biggest rat bag. Like, and we always say like, even in, you know, when we introduce you, it's like, you're this crazy rebel misfit, like goofy, wildly successful and wildly wealthy, but you're all these other phenomenal things. And I think that's when you, to take it back to what you were saying before, how you do have this superpower of just connecting with people. And this is such a teachable moment that I think it is all of those, th like, you know, who you are, you live into it so beautifully and you can just show up in this big, bold way in the world, but, and more like, where did that start for you? Like, obviously don't take advice from broken, unhappy people, but where was that moment that you were like, because, and let me, t let me tell this story. I'm from stage when you said this, and this was so big for me that your first $10,000 month and you said, no one had told me that I was worth $10,000. This is like forever ago, but it was like the first ah, time yeah, that I you earned $10,000 $10, in a yeah. month. You were like, well, no one had told me that I was worth $10,000. And I think for people that are listening, it's like, that's, that's where they're stuck right now. It's like, no one's actually told them or they don't believe that they're worth more or that. Well, I think someone's, someone's told them, you know, it's usually, and I know you train on this as well, like a teacher sets people's expectations on what they what, you know, what a job's worth and what they can get and all that sort of thing. But a lot of the time they're earning 60, $70,000 a year. And well, I think, that's it. I mean, I think more what you're saying there is that I don't think people, I always say that if you were to close your eyes right now, those of you listening and you imagine a bubble over your head, like one of those think bubbles. Mm -hmm. And then if you took your average income over the last five to 10 years. So some of you, if you're in sales, you may have bumper years, but your financial thermostat is set for a certain amount of money. And you know, your, even if you have, it's like people who win the lottery, if they mm -hmm. thermostat set for broke, two years later, they're going to be broke at about 85% of people who win the lottery, people who buy lottery tickets, that's their plan B typically, you know, mm -hmm. when I, my mom still says that when I win the lottery and she's like 86 or something. Right. So I think that what happens is we don't know we have a number. We don't know we have a program number that we live into. And so when we choose a career, you know, let's say in Canada, you choose to be a teacher, you, you know, that teacher's job is going to earn you about 60 to $70,000 a year for the rest of your life. And, but we don't think that we don't think I want to be a teacher because I want to help. We don't say I want to be a teacher and earn $60,000 a year for the rest of my life. It doesn't compute. And so what happens with the work that we do 
is that, you know, we can radically change that number, but I had a number because I grew up in poverty. Mm -hmm. And so with that, my mom, my brother, and my sister all worked at the same car factory making diesel parts. So my, my, what was expected is that I would join them at the factory floor and I can still smell. If you've ever been to a diesel factory, there's a smell in there that you can't ever eradicate from your senses. And that's the smell they went to work on every single day. And my sister worked and she was happy working on this machine, doing the same thing over and over and over and over and over again. Right. And the other thing that I, my father was in the military and I didn't see my father until I was 15, but there was this, this kind of conversation is joining the military. And mm -hmm. I had hair all the way down to my ass and there was no way I was cutting my hair. So the military was out. And so for me, it was a lucky, it was a happenstance that I ended up leaving the environment and the environment is everything. Mm. Who we're listening to right now, your friends you're listening to typically are going to be within 10 or 15% of your income, yep. you know, cause most people's income, you hang around people who have similar incomes than you. It's mm -hmm. just normal. And so the idea is that, you know, if you see this bubble above your head and, and once we're aware of it, then the question I always like to ask Anna is, okay, if you had to add a zero to it, so if you're making 60,000 yep. and you had to earn, you add a zero, that's $600,000 a year. Who do I have to become to earn 600,000? And so going back to your kind of question is, I, th what happened to me as a survivor, I just survived. I survived from a young age. I left home at 15 and I've always been on my own ever since. So I'm a survivor, but luckily I, I sort of, moved into an environment where I started to hear a new language, like, like the language you talk, both of you. And more, you just said, you didn't have that language. Mm. You know, yeah. well, don't take advice from broken, happy people because, you know, we don't know what we don't know. And the world we grew up in is the only world that exists for us, right? So that's the reality. So I think, to, I don't know if I've answered it properly, yeah. Anna, but I think, yeah. And I think, and do you know what, with that, I'm like, that's just triggered something else with me. And this is something that you make me so conscious of in all ways. So how you do anything is how you do everything is, is the thing that you've taught me. And I always say to Morgan, he laughs, like, I can't step over litter, for example, because I have to pick it up because in my head, it's like, Anna, how you do anything is how you do everything. If you step over this litter, what else are you ignoring of, you know, injustices in the world? And it's like, to that level, it's just like, that's, that's how you've programmed me essentially. But what you just said on how you, um, you know, where you grew up from. And I know there's so much more to your story that you don't even go into. I've sort of heard you say snippets over time, but you know, everything I think that could have ever happened to an individual I know has basically happened to you. Actually, Morgs wanted to know if you've been in jail. We're going to go back to that. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And I said, I'm pretty yes. sure he has. I'm pretty and I may sure. Be, I may be going to jail soon because my, I haven't seen my girlfriend now in five and a half months. And so the only country I can fly into in Europe is England. And I was just thinking about whether I can, I, I know I can find a fisherman and I know that I can pay him some money to, to land me on the coastline of, uh, you know, of Europe. Yeah. And so I'm thinking about, you know, coming in How like in a small village in a fishing village in France and somehow, you know, with a beret and sort of looking inconspicuous <laughs> as I hitchhike yeah. out of town. To tell, and I, I'm serious. And I'm thinking, no, well, I you know, know that, you are. that would be serious jail time. But now I, yeah, I've been chased by the police quite often and caught a few times. Yeah. I see, babe, I told I was like, I'm, pr I'm convinced you, you have. You'll be able but, to add international biohazard to your uh, list of things too. If you <laughs> go through Europe. So it's not yeah, a bad one. It. But you <laughs> taught us, you taught us and you just said it. So I said, you know, what was the moment or what were the moments that allowed you to become who you were into who you are? And you said, well, I got out of my environment. And the other thing that you've taught me, which I think everybody needs to hear over and over again, is that environment is stronger than willpower. Right. And you taught me that like you, it's you and people say that to me all the time. And this is such a small, insignificant thing, but we do have a lot of women that listen. They say, Anna, how do you have so much willpower with your health? Or how do you stay on track so much? And I'm like, well, my environment is stronger than my willpower. So I don't have crap in my house because that's my environment. And if crap's in my environment, I'm going to eat it. If, because I don't like the willpower is there, but the environment is stronger. So I just don't have it. And I think you taught me that. So if people are listening right now and they are stuck in that environment of people that, are, you know, earning what they're earning and putting others down and talking about people and just kind of, they're stuck in that rat race of, um, you know, constantly earning, like they want to do better. They want to have more. They like, where can they begin? Well, you know, awareness is always the first key to change, right? So, you know, the fact you're listening to this is, 
the awareness part because you're starting to question. Mm -hmm. And with that question, right? So you may be noticing that a lot of people around you have a negative vibe or a negative conversation or a limiting vibe or a limiting, a limiting converse, conversation. So with that being said, you know, even just spending some time each day reading or listening mm -hmm. a podcast, a book, and so what we're starting to do is start to feed ourselves new information. With that new information comes new awareness. With new awareness, we started noticing differently. So there's a part of the brain called the, the RAS, the reticular mm -hmm. activating system. And the way to think about it, look, I'm because those of you watching on video, I'm changing my glasses right now. Hold on a sec. There you go. Sunnies are on, right? So I want you to imagine, I didn't know I needed props, but they're just here. Yeah, yeah, hey, hey. <laughs> Black pen? No, okay. Yeah. <laughs> right. So the circle dot. So, <laughs> yeah. uh, Glass of water. Okay. Um, yeah. So, but what happens is this imagine the security detail of a president or a queen or a king, whatever it is, right? And typically, what do they do? They were in black suits or the CIA or whatever they are. They have their dark glasses on. And what are they looking for? Threats. Threats. Threats and danger. And they're typically very solemn, right? And they just stand in the crowd and they're just scouring for what's wrong. The brain, the RAS, the reticular activating system does this same. It's the thing that processes the things that come into our awareness, right? So our non-conscious mind processes at about 4 billion with a B, that's the non-conscious mind, 4 billion bits of information every second. Our conscious mind about 2000. But we live predominantly through our thoughts, the things that come into our head. And our thoughts are predominantly negative and mm. repetitive. Right. So if we have a negative, repetitive thought process, which most people do scientifically, what happens is our RAS is looking and scouring the environment to make you right. And mm. so if, like, if, if you think people are negative, you could be at a party where every single person is dancing and happy and your brain, because you have a predominant thought pattern of negativity, will look around. There'll be one guy in the corner looking all sullen or looking um, threatening or looking dishonest and your mind's going to go see i told you people were negative or mm. a woman a gorgeous woman who's been told 35 times that she's gorgeous tonight she'll walk into a room but if her predominant thought pattern is i'm ugly or you know people don't like me she'll walk in and she'll scour her brains non-consciously is looking to make her right and it will point out the woman that's scouring at her now that woman may have gas she may not be scouring <laughs> at all, right? But she's looking. It would be me. Looking around. Yeah, exactly. I know. I was going to say that. All right. But, but then, so then the RAS is always making us right. And so one of the th ways they, they, they demonstrate this in, in, sort of scientifically, should I change glasses? or Change glasses. Change glasses. Yeah. All right. So one of the ways that we, we look at that is they, they ran an ad in the New York Times and they ran an ad for a job and the job, everything about the ad was identical. And the ad was written... Um, exactly the same font, the same size, uh, the same qualifications were necessary, the same phone number. The only thing was different was one was for $35,000 a year. The other one was for $105,000 a year. 85% of the people responded to the $35,000 a year because their RAS was programmed for 35 grand. And even though they had the qualifications, their brain couldn't see it because they, they can't see themselves at 105,000. So even if the opportunity is in front of them, they can't even see it. So the work is reprogramming the brain. So then, because this is a great saying too, right? I love my inner world creates my outer world. Yeah. What I think on the inside manifests on the outside, including money. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's and funny that, as well. I think they call that sort of thing as well, like a, a negative feedback loop. So it's like negative behavior reinforces negative behavior and creates more negative behavior. And it's almost like a downward spiral for some people as well. Um, and I know like sometimes um, people really struggle with it too. They, they can't break that habit. Like the lady who walks in the room, no matter how hard she tries, she just gets stuck in that spiral and she finds behavior that reinforces and reinstates to her why she's right. So, but I want to say, and David, something that I love about you and I innately and babe, you know, this, like I, mm. people have asked me for a long time, having, you know, grown up in, you know, lots of trauma and blah, blah, blah. But I always say people go, but, but what, 
what was it for you? And I'm like, I made a decision. I decided I just didn't want to like at bottom of the shower or in bed rocking that night at my rock bottom. It was like, I just decided. And this is what I love the most. I truly believe. I mean, everything about you partying on Belize for 24 hours um, together. But the, the thing is only 24. Just, I thought it was 48. There was like, there was, well, it was seven <laughs> days actually, but um, no, but it's that you say you're like, just decide. Like I'm, I've watched you coach people and you're like, just decide. It's like they've got 20, 30, 40 years or five if you're younger or 10 if you're 30 of this story and this program that they've been running of unworthiness and um, mm. not good enough. And you are just, you're like, it, can you go there? Can you explain how your belief, because this is, I love it. It's like, because everyone's listening right now and they're going, that's me. I walk into the party and I think like that, or I keep putting weight back on because I don't think I'm worthy or um, I am not keep earning. All my I, money. Yeah. I want to put that zero in the bubble, but I'm just not that person. Sure. What, how can they just make that decision and, and go? Well, decision. Yes, you can make it. However, we want to look at how we programmed ourselves. And this is quite hard to do. The easiest way when I do one-on-one -on -one coaching with people, Typically, what I start to notice immediately is their language. Mm. So, and so eradicating negative, low energy, destructive language from your vocabulary is a great start because this is how we start the reprogramming process. And there's a thing called neuroplasticity, mm. which is showing that we can completely rewire the brain. Mm. And we don't have to stay the same. We used to think that if you had a bad childhood, you're going to grow up to be a bad kid, have a bad life and be broke. But it's not true. What they're showing now, and most of the studies about the brain are showing us that if we want to reprogram and rewire the brain, we can. And so, so we can transform it completely. And one of the quickest ways is to notice, for example, the word need. I need to go to work. Well, mm -hmm. dear, you don't need to go to work. You can stay home. Now, you may not make, earn any money, but you don't need to go. You choose to go. Mm -hmm. and, but choose has one energy and need has another. Right? I can't. Mm -hmm right? Can't has, a, I mean, I'll do my best. So what it is, is I look at every single time I, I listen to someone speak, I ask, I, I notice a word and I just simply notice it. And then I ask them to replace it and say, just don't use that word ever again in the rest of your life. So I catch myself like the word should, I should do this. Mm. And I was thinking, stop shooting on yourself. Right. And so, and there's I, the word hate. I, I, I mean, I, I use a lot of profanity, much like Morgs, <laughs> but yeah. the word hate <laughs> is the worst English. It's the worst word. I mean, yeah. some people think the C word is, I think hate is much worse because, you know, we make up the interpretation, right? Yeah. So if we can start to, and Anna, to sort of answer your question, if we can start to notice the language we're currently using and just systematically find a word that has low energy or low power or low meaning, and we, we replace it and consciously start to change that, even that one tiny step can radically change how we show up. Because yeah. if I'm choosing to go to work, right? It's much different. I'm choosing it. So you go with a lighter energy. When you go with a lighter energy, you attract more things. So that's one. Going back to the point about the decision, I think that the decision right now is if you're listening to this, you know you're looking for something. There's only, only one reason why you're spending this much time listening yeah. is because there's something that you're looking for, something you want, and you think it's here. And so it's not the question of listening to this and then commenting, oh, I liked it. Mm -hmm. The comment should be, hey, this is one thing I took away and this is how I'm implementing it in my life. And I'm going to check it in 30 days and tell you how it went. So take one idea and build on it. And as you start to, to see success with one thing, you have the confidence to do the next thing. But what happens is with personal development, people start laying out their whole life mm -hmm. in front of them and it looks like a mountain to climb versus, hey, if I just change the word, this one word, I keep using that could change my life. And that's how simple change is. I you love know. that. You know, it's so funny as well, David, you talk about like the power of language and something I've talked to Anna about a lot. Like these days, there's a lot of people that want to be personal development coaches and trainers. <laughs> and one thing that I've noticed, well, you, we can go there. <laughs> well, we, we can, but it's not what I'm where I'm, where I'm going with this is that um, one of the first things I picked up on, on that you do in a lot of your work is when someone stands Ooh. up to talk and they say, what we need to do, what you need to do is you're very quick to sell, to get them to change their language and say, um, I, 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 and I've noticed that there's a lot of trainers out there and, and coaches that give advice and what you need to do, what we need to do. And 
what I want to know is where did this, this idea about, you know, changing it from what, what's the, the, the thought pattern behind changing it from a you and a we to an I? Yeah. It's such a great question, Walt. Um, <clears throat> I think the revelation or the realization, because again, remember I, as a survivor, I leave in school at 50. I say survivor is not like, you know, I, yeah, I've survived some hard stuff and some, some stuff that would make, <laughs> make a lot of people's hair curl, but I'm talking about survivor, just, you know, being able to go through life and never being helped financially or, mm -hmm. you know, finding my path. So that's what I mean by surviving. I want to give context to that. Um, but when I discovered the power of the word I, mm -hmm. I think it was before I started to really become financially well off. I was, I was emotionally, you know, maybe even emotionally, but my spirit was so well off from all of the travels and all of the people and what I did for so many years. But to sort of transfer that into a financial life where I can design and create, you've been in my home, you know, mm -hmm. you know, design and, I don't know if there's a word called perfect. I don't like that word very much, but it's perfect for me. I designed mm -hmm. the perfect life in every, every single area is exactly by design. And it's when I discovered the power of I that it really started to happen because I took personal responsibility for everything in my life and everything not in my life. So if it wasn't in my life, I took responsibility for it and said, well, how do I have to adapt grow, change, expand, think, you know, whatever it is, how do I, and so I, and that's where, you know, moving away from victim and so many people play victim. It's like right now when I hear people talk about Corona, right. And I probably don't even want to talk about it on the show. Right. But anything it's like goes, that, but it's, it makes it sound like, you know, it's a thing, right. That could somehow have an impact on your day. Really? <laughs> but the, the, one of my favorite words or one of my other superpowers that I love is I'm a, supremely adaptable. Mm. So there's nothing about the situation that I dislike because disliking it is just going to make me, Oh yeah. When this thing's over, what if, what if it isn't, mm. are you going to waste this whole day thinking about something, just adapt to what's happening, not what you wish was happening. And that gives you supreme power because it's like, yeah, this is the best time of my life. Mm. And cause that's, I think adaptability is really one of the keys there. Right? And I, I think, think like, taking ownership, your question? taking ownership as well of where you're at and where you want to go I think as well is pretty, pretty important. But we're going to, you want to ask me a question. You know, I was just saying, did that answer your question? Yeah, the, it did. The responsibility yeah, it did. part. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah on, I loved it. On, on the thing of coaching though, we, we won't go that we're going to do a whole podcast on, on just being discerning with. Let's do, you, let's do three shows. That way oh, you we're, just, you're like, we just on. we're going to do one with some wine and talk about all of our favorite travel adventures together. About that. Um, we'll but, do an adults only one where we can like do some, do some jokes. sex. <laughs> I'll do just. <laughs> oh, you are like you. This is the thing about David, and this speaks perfectly to what I was about to say. Is that I think I truly believe, and David taught me this. So you taught me this through embodiment. Is that the best coaches just embody their message, and it is about that self responsibility. And instead of saying um, you need to do this, it's like, hey, I'm just over here living this self responsible kick ass life, which is your saying. Um, but, and I learn through your embodiment, you do have this life by design. And it's like, you have the wealth, you have the beautiful relationship with beautiful Asta, you have this dream house you have all these things but you are supremely happy and you don't talk about that you just embody that and that to me i think for my own self looking to mentorship is you know from knowing you intimately and not david i remember the first time we were talking about this this morning i said morgs goes oh i'm going to tell him this story of and you have to the first time i met him and i said i remember the first time i saw david so you it was you were on stage uh, in Vegas and we'd won the trip. Morgs was still like, what am I even doing I here? Let me go Vegas. get drunk at the bar. <laughs> and you, this man, you pop up on stage, the most energetic in your body, just inspiring, fun, goofy, radical, you know, with saying all of these crazy things that I'd never heard of before, even having done personal development at that stage for only about four years, five years. So not that long, but long enough. I'd read the Robins, I'd done all the things. And I remember crying within that four minutes and saying to Morgan, I don't know who he is and I don't know like what the deal is, but, and you were talking about, you, you can go on your Island and do this training. I'm like, I'm going on the Island. And then, you know, the story goes four months later, I was on the Island, but which you don't, 
do anymore, which you should. We should actually all go on the island. Um, <laughs> but it is. It's that discernment. I, this is what I want people to understand. I think when you look to coaches and you look to mentors, it's look for that embodiment of their message and look for that self-responsibility and the language. It's exactly what you're all saying. It just ties all back in so beautifully. Like the well, language. You know, I, I, I think that people are like influencers. I mean, we're going to go there. I can feel it. <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, it, everyone's in a personal development. Everyone's got this thing, but they're in the business of selling personal development. Right. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I just don't want to be in that business. It's like, you know, I mean, I work with Tony, Tony Robbins. We just mentioned his name. Right. But, Tony doesn't have deep friendships with his students because mm -hmm. Tony is a superpower, right? And mm -hmm. deep friendships can occur because it's a business of that. And a lot of these influences online, right? It's just, you know, I'd love to take some of them in a real situation. I mean, you've mm -hmm. been with me on one of my programs. Like, well, I take them up into a, a you know, a, a high stress situation and see how they really handle life because it's so easy if you're good with the camera, if you're good with, you know, marketing, if you're good with these things to appear to, have the answer and people are looking so they are gullible they think they can buy the next answer and buy the next answer and buy the mm. next answer and i think that's the shame the shame is that you know like you said if the person if i was going to invest i'll give you an example this is a great example my banker is the number one banker in canada for eight years in a row he's like one of my close friends he comes over here he helps out he's an electronics wizard my lawyer i play pool with every single saturday and we have a, we cook for each other but every single person i spend money with are deep personal friends of mine that i can and that's what it should be. If you're going to coach with someone, if, if there isn't an opportunity to get, like we are, we're friends, Yeah. you know, and you were students, but now I'm a student of yours. I mean, I can learn as much from you as you can from me. And I think that's, that's how I want to live my life in relationships with real people, not trying to buy the answer, you know, yeah. notice what's working in someone and follow people where, you know, you can see and sense and hear it like this. We didn't have a chat before and no. find out what we were talking about. <laughs> we just, yeah. these, these are the only questions I had. With the yeah, fast five. Those first five. And, <laughs> and, he, and he almost forgot those. <laughs> he did, everyone. He really did. No, I love that. No, that's great. It's because uh, there's a lot of it out there as well. And, you know, like I think, Pete, like Anna said, like people just need to be so discerning. And, and this is what I love about you is like you, the things that you talk about and that you train on from stage, you're the same person off the stage as you are on stage and you live into those things. And that's, I think, um, where all that, authenticity comes from you mentioned it at the start right living an authentic life and you do that and i think that's why um so much of your work is so is so impactful because people there's no there's no there's no mirrors there's no and there's no peering back behind the sheet well the, you are peering back behind the sheet when you look at you on stage as well and i think that um is you know it's that like i said it is a superpower and i think so many people aspire to that and want that and like they said they, they want to buy it because that's the shortcut, right? Mm. But there's no shortcut to doing the work. And you taught me, David, as well, like, cause I always laugh and I do and I have to say it, that when people meet me, I got stopped in the gym yesterday by a beautiful girl. She's probably going to be listening to this as well. But but I, I get this compliment and I'm putting the whatever they are, asterisks of when people meet me, they go, oh my gosh, you're exactly like you are online. Like it's this big compliment and it's, and, and but that is the norm today. And I think that, who you taught me this it's like well who you are you used to say who you are on the stage Anna, and you said this to all your um students the million that you've trained it's like who you are on the stage is who you are off the stage who you are online is who you are offline who you are in front of cameras is who you should be behind closed doors who you and this is all you like this is what you've taught us and i think yeah. that this is the message especially in 2020 like this is why we wanted to interview you we're going to do billions with you because it's like to me, you're the guy in 2020 that can lead, continue to lead. You've led forever. You've trained over a million students, but it's like, these are the messages I think in a social media hungry, electronic, digital heavy generation that we need to be yeah. hearing <clears throat> that it's, yeah. Well, and I think that, I think your point, which I love is that, you know, most people wear masks, not because they want to, mm. but they feel that the mask is a way of them fitting in. And, you know, young people wear masks as a way of avoiding the tyranny of their parents and teachers. Old people wear masks, older people wear masks to fit in, to be liked. So, you know what I mean by wearing masks is, and the way to define it, I like, is think about how you are with your absolute best friend when you're most authentic, when you Daddy. feel most, 
whoever that is, what a lot of you don't get is one of the major secrets is those of us that live that. that so there isn't a mask. There's no need for a mask in front mm -hmm. of anyone, right? And I will say that the, the only time <laughs> occasionally I have to wear a mask is going through borders. <laughs> if I'm doing something a little, if I'm doing something a little, if I'm doing something a little dodgy, <laughs> right, right. That, that sometimes I don't have to. I don't always because you know my eight most favorite words is tell the truth all the, all the time. time. Yeah, compassion. with compassion, with compassion, but not always at the border. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. And so, not always at tax time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, <laughs> but but the idea is that you know if you wanted to sort of step into a superpower today, each one of you listening mm. is to just discover and notice and just write down the name of the person where you're most alive, you're most yourself, you feel like that's your true identity, authenticity. Mm -hmm. And even if it sounds different from everybody else, maybe it's cruder, maybe it's sillier, maybe it's, it's quieter, it doesn't matter. And you say, well, okay, that would be the guide. That would be your inner guide to say, okay, I'm going to start being like that with everyone. And people aren't used to it because you're wearing the mask. But what you're going to find is when you don't wear the mask and you're absolutely yourself, I guarantee your income is going to accelerate. Mm -hmm. Your friendships will, will, will go deeper. You're going to walk through life. You're going to start seeing things very, very differently because right now you're attempting to fit in. And there's nothing to fit into. But when you're completely yourself, you're going to attract the things that fill your, fill your soul because they're going to be naturally attracted to you. And Stuart Wilde, he's a famous author. He says, you know, if I can remember the quote now. <laughs> anyway, he says something really great. He's amazing. <laughs> we'll find it. Was it was so good. Get your pens out. Hold on. I can't Best remember what ever heard Hold on. There's a, big, there's a big, big gold nugget coming. No, yeah. there's not. <laughs> No, that's awesome. It's what, what, it'll come to you as you think, David, but yeah. what, where I want to go with this, because I'm like, this is it. This is a juice. This, I mean, it's all been juicy, but the biggest thing that just came to me that the number one fear, I think, from you know, my own work with working with women predominantly, everybody is scared of what people will think of them. Yeah. And so oh, they've just heard you say that and then gone, oh my God, that is my dream. And some are probably emotional. Like I would love to be that person all the time, but what is my friend going to think of me or my husband? But it's like those, so can you speak to that? Because maybe yeah. they'll drop away out of their life. Well, they, they, they may be. And you know, what happens is, <clears throat> you know, Eleanor Roosevelt, she was, she was one of those great people. I do remember her quote. I don't remember half of Stuart Wilde's, but, um, you know, was, you know, what other people think, <laughs> what other people think of me is none of my business. Right. Yeah. Uh, and she was so ballsy. Right. And, and I think, you know, the fear of loss when you're being inauthentic. Um, so you're, you, so you're, you're being inauthentic to keep something, a job, a friendship, you know, even with your parents, right. Not being afraid to tell them the absolute truth. So, but we teach the world how to treat us. Mm -hmm. So when you've got your mask on, you're teaching everyone how to treat you. So the world is treating you inauthentically because you're inauthentic mm -hmm. and they don't know because you're pretending, but most other people are pretending too. So everyone's out there. So when someone like me comes along and Anna or Morks comes along and you're completely authentic, it's, it's almost like scary in the beginning. And then it's, oh, and you mm -hmm. see people relax and they say shit that they've always wanted to say and they feel seen, really seen. Mm -hmm. And, and that's why I use a lot of affection. I kiss all my men, friends, more you know this, how many times I've kissed you, right? Yeah. But the idea I walk up to strangers and embrace them in a new energy, like my banker, like, you know, if you're listening, Jay, <laughs> right? <laughs> Hi, Jay. You're, you know, but he could be a grumpy bastard, really. But with me, I can feel he's alive. You know, we have this wonderful friendship and it's like deep and honest and real. And he shares his heart with me. And here he is like, hi, 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 up in the, up in the back. But I expect if I text him at three o'clock in the morning, I expect a freaking answer. And I get it. <laughs> right? and, and it's just like, but that's how I bank. I want to bank with. So this what happens is when you step into authenticity in a real honest way, the people around you step in with you. Yeah. And they're able to be themselves. So you become someone very special to them because they, they may not, they may be wearing masks in other situations, especially if you're at a bank, you know, uh, it, it, that, that you may be wearing a mask. And so it's actually, what's the word? It's like, uh, when, when you feel relieved, it's, um, it's liberation, it's like a, liberation, yeah, liberating. Yeah. That's the word I was looking for. Yeah. Liberating. Right. So I know what, and I, my biggest lesson so far from this podcast is that, uh, to keep your banker and your lawyer close. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> well, do you know what? Our accountants, I always say to people, your accountant should be like your best friend. Like mm, our is. accountants is like, we, we would, we'll go drinking with them. We love our accountants. And a bit now I'm like, we need a, we need a banker, honey. And we need to text them at 3am. Get on the pits with us. I'm so any, any, any single person you do business with, it doesn't matter. You can name anything I do. My builders, like the builders here doing the renovation. Um, and, you know, we went golfing together, right? Oh, Just the other day, right? Guy, I work out, this is a great story, actually. I, I love this because, you know, and again, so I work out and the hour before, and I change my times, I work out five days a week with my trainer. And, but there's a couple that comes in and so over the last three years, I've been going to the same gym. Um, I, we always joke and laugh and joke and laugh. And I went up to him last week and I said, you know, it's time. It's time we had a beer together, you know? And he kind of like dodged around it a little bit, right? And his wife is quite dominant, very dominant, right? And he's, he's actually a locksmith. And somehow, intention, he ends up sitting on my deck here. Of he course. sat out here, he doesn't drink beer. But he drinks rum and coke, but I poured him a draft beer and we sat out there and we sat out there for about two hours and just, I just talked to him, listened to his life story. I went to his house, you know, and he was so proud and I loved his home and it's very, very simple. And I can, and I loved it and I was really, really into it. But when, of course, coming here, this is like, and he walks through and he says, you know, I, I have a lot of really wealthy clients, but I've never really been in their homes. And no. that's how he felt. He felt like, yeah. but here we are developing a real friendship right now it doesn't matter about status it doesn't matter who owns what it matters that i am interested and in, we don't have a tremendous amount in common but i'm thinking this guy's in my life five days a week i see this guy why won't we just create a friendship so it becomes even real right mm. does that make sense yeah oh, i'm just thinking of this story i'm smiling because and i'm laughing because i'm like I remember at one of the um, a massive conference that we were all at, and every year, and we and the oh, who were the famous people? Oh my God, Maroon Five were playing. Oh, David, do you remember this? So Maroon Five were playing, and there was the VI VI VIP area. So it was basically for like the founders of the company and like like peak our best friends essentially. And I remember they had their own security, so it wasn't like the company security. The like Maroon Five bought in their security now nobody got through like nobody got through this this gate like it was just it was the most intense security i've ever seen and then along comes you <laughs> and you they were like hugging you and like high-fiving you and you just like strolled in and you're like yeah no we, we just made friends and they weren't even letting like they had to like id check the founders i was like well you, you know, know well, well, i go to those big events and i refuse to wear any id for that same reason i thought if i can't get in with my personality alone i shouldn't oh. i don't deserve to be in there <laughs> well, it was. Just, I was like you, that, but that is, and I think if I take anything from this, it's just, it's truly the embodiment of relationships that you build, and I think that's that's the the purpose of life ultimately to live, to laugh, to love, to have fun, to have great sex. Uh, yeah, to slow, extraordinary, slow down. Extra extraordinary sex. S slow down, men. Um, slow down. Slow why do you why do you keep looking at your husband when you say that? Yeah, I'm like slow down. <laughs> I love this advice. You can speed up as well, Mox. It's bold. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> do it all. Do it all. I have a funny story. This is um, again, and I, I really respect Tony Robbins. I'm gonna use Tony again. Yeah. Because it really for me it, it epitomizes this thing I'm we're talking about. Is Tony and I you were at the same event yep. where Tony yep. was there. So Tony trained for three hours i trained mm -hmm. for three and a half hours <laughs> no i'm just kidding yeah. that, was, that, <laughs> that, was, that was that was that was the ego all right but <laughs> but tony shows up and he has his security detail and there are armed guards on the stage right and i was sitting right at the front and i was acknowledging the guard who wouldn't even look at me you talk about you know with the dark glasses mm. he would, and every single time tony who's six foot seven ran into the audience the security guard with a gun ran behind him into the audience every single time. And so even our mic guy couldn't put the, my, the a special person just to put his mic on was flown in to put the mic on him, and which is great. Here is one of the giants of the world, giant person, and we're at an event full of love. And yet there's all these guns and there's the protection and there's the fear and even photographs afterwards, same with Maroon 5. They wouldn't take photographs with the kids, no, you know, know. and Adam Levine. And I, I just thought, what a shame. His guitar player was beautiful and really giving, but it was just like this fear. 
Mm-hmm. Then a few weeks later, I'm in Italy. My son was performing at the Vatican for the Pope. Oh, I remember. Right? Yeah. Right? Wow. So I arrive at 5.30 in the morning with my girlfriend. We didn't have tickets because we didn't know we were going to be there. And so we walk into Vatican Square and there's a woman in a wheelchair and there's a couple with them. And I said, hey, do you want me to take some photographs for you? So we're taking photographs. Son's coming up. And I tell him a story that, you know, I'm here to see my son. And I said, we don't have tickets, though. And the woman says, wait. And she pulled out two tickets from her bag. She says, I have two extras, right? I can't make this shit up, right? No, of course. So then we go in and there's 16,000 people because it was indoors. Normally it's in the square, but because of the weather, it was indoors. And I didn't know where where my son was. So where we ended up sitting, my son ended up two rows in front. I could speak to him. I'm like, hey, (laughs) Carl. You would have too. Yeah, yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Right? Anyway, so what happens is then Pope Francis walks in. Now, remember, I've just seen Tony working with, you know, a super. Now, here's Francis, the most known face on the planet, walks in the back. He takes an hour to walk from the back to the stage, and he hugs and kisses every single child. And people are grabbing him, and some people are hugging him, like, ferociously. Uh-huh. And his, his envoys, who are all, like, what are they called, ones in red, whatever they are, they whatever. just gently touch, they just gently touch someone on the arm. No fear, no force, just love. And he mm. walks all the way to the front. He does this thing for an hour, uh, the, the mass. Then he walks and he's, he goes and hugs every single person in a wheelchair. And then he spends another hour, hour and a half going back all the way through, hugging everyone again. And that's what I really, what I got was this. And I had the same experience with the, the Dalai Lama who really mm. changed my world, changed my life. But watching Francis with no fear, Mm. And then watching a personal development kind of guru with fear and thinking, hold on, there's the lesson. And mm. I want to walk through the world with zero fear. Mm. What am I afraid of? And I want to use love as such a powerful force of connection that even if someone was a bad person, they're going to feel my love and they're not going to do anything bad to me because I'm just a genuinely kind generous human being and I'm going to hug or reach out to them or smile at them or talk to them or include them in a way that they've never been included. And that's those having those two experiences side by side was revealing and life changing. And I've even had that with at one of your events that I had spoken at a leadership event, you had some big names there and it was different to, uh, I remember Mike Dooley, who's like one of my, you know, I love him and yeah, you set up this brother beautiful, from another your, mother. your brother from another mother. And I remember you had said to me, oh, I'll introduce you. Like it was ain't no thing. And I was like, no, but I remember you then, you know, said, come backstage, you know, rah, rah. And I got to introduce him, but I'll never, ever forget David walking like to the back to then, you know, meet him very quickly to introduce him and the way, and I know you, that you, everything you've talked about is exactly your embodiment of love and just leadership and everything. But then for Mike, who for me is this, you know, world-class author, incredibly famous in my world, he was the same. He just was this beautiful gave me a big bear hug, just looked me in the eye, treated me like a normal person. And I was, I'll never, ever forget that. I'll never forget how he made me feel like I've read his books and I've done all those things, but then I'll, and I think that to me was a lesson that that's how I want to be. No matter what happens in the world, it's like, take that time. Exactly. Live with no fear. Look people, take the time to hug someone and it's fine because the yeah. girl stopped me in the gym yesterday and I was like, I should have. I was like, I want to give you a big hug, but then not letting people in the gym touch each other. It's oh, I, I, I've, been, I've been so bad. <laughs> like, <laughs> no, you've been so good. I'm still hugging. So are we. Look, so are we. But I, I call oh, it the corona you. hug. Yeah. Yes. Get it. Lick their face. Just get in there. Um, but yeah, it's, I just think that's such a beautiful message. All right. So. Hey, so- we're- Oh. I know we're coming up on time, but I do just want to get a chance. I know you've done podcasts before, I, David. Was this but... not two hours? I thought it was two hours, wasn't it? I don't know. <laughs> we don't like, have... Let's just get going. Pour another draft beer. No. Uh, I yeah. do want to just give you a quick chance. Well, I know you've done po- your own podcast before. You've had uh, Kick-Ass Life uh, and Amplified. Network Marketing. Yeah, um, Amplified Network Amplified. Marketing. Um, but you've got a new one now. Yeah, yeah. It's, yeah. Uh, I'm doing another thing. It's, um, it's actually quite fun getting back interviewing again. I love to interview it's called My Extra Mile, Conversations with David T.S. Wood. It's a YouTube channel, um, so it's video. You can listen to it the same Go way. Go subscribe. Like a, yeah, you got to subscribe, push like if you like, but get involved in the conversation. Um, got some great people on there. You two are going to be on there next week, I think. Yep. Yeah, um, we're interviewed on yeah, Thursday. Yeah. Um, yeah, but it's, you know, it's just during COVID, I just wanted to get back out, and I just forgot how much, I mean, because I did 
hundreds and hundreds of shows with mm. some some fascinating people through the the kick ass life and i i got away from it for the last few years and just talking like we are now i don't feel like i'm on a podcast mm. i feel like we're just having a chat you know and that's how it is and you know when you get into that zone where you can just chat with people it's so beautiful so yeah, yeah. thank you for awesome. plugging it yeah, no I was, it, it was it was both a plug and a genuine question as well because yeah i haven't had a chance yet to check it out so um wind, did you feel the wind in my mic because the wind's yeah. blowing up that's yeah, all right sorry. do you want me to do that he's like trying to cover it right. i love it um no and that, no but it's so true so I, but can i just say i think even today like even though you don't do the podcast anymore on the kick-ass life or amplified network marketing to me they are still who i you we've got it on our team mindset you know in our mindset section for our team it's still the kick-ass life amplified network marketing we still plug it so it's like go back guys if you if you love this conversation with david go and look it's still on itunes um you can look it up but definitely go and watch and listen and get amongst my extra mile i think it's the extra mile or is it my extra mile my extra mile it's my extra mile i probably know what it is (laughs) <laughs> well, do you know what? Knowing you, I'm like, mm, do you? Like, Denise would. Yeah, that's, the PA that's, so, would. that's yeah. so true. Yeah. David looks off camera. Uh, Denise, what's it called again? Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> you're true. Hey, I, I, my, by the way, those of you who can see, if you're not listening with a video, I put my pillow up to stop the wind because I'm sitting outside in my garden. So the wind just suddenly picked up. It's Is that perfect. better, Morgs? It's uh, yeah. yeah, that's fine. It's only, it's been intermittent, mate, and it's, it's fine. You thought I'm breathing uh, heavy, everyone. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, that's another, but we can do a Living whole at altitude. Yeah. Hey, um, by the way, let me say this. Congratulations. This is a format. Very easy. You two are very, very special together. So I, I'm very excited. And we could, might as well tell people, I said, interview me first because you're going to learn a lot and you can sort of tweak out the bugs. And But yes. you guys, you know, you just got it. You've got the cadence and you've got the the genuine hearts, the right, just the, the right vibe. I mean, this is going to be a really, really powerful and big show. It's going to be massive, That's you great. know, and I, I just, uh, I, I just can see it reaching a lot of people. Well, the guests help, the guests helps a lot. I mean, having someone on like you is, you know, there's no stale moments. There's no awkward silences or anything like that. So it's great. And, no, and, and we'll end it here because, but I just want to, I do, I'm like, we're just like re-honoring each other back, but <laughs> But we have launched the podcast and David is extremely successful and amazing. And you're going to hear it in the intro, but, and you would have heard it the whole podcast long, but he's the guy that actually said to us when we had asked him if we could interview him, he said, well, do me first, because like, if you're, if you're nervous or you can iron out the bugs and we actually had to the first 10, 15 minutes, Morgs had to move mics and change it all up. And it's God, I think on. We, yep. had to, we had to get dressed, <laughs> <Yep>. <laughs> do it nude. Um, absolutely. So yeah, no, we just love you. We honor you. We're so excited to have done this podcast and there'll be many more with you.